Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Teeley. I help coordinate uh, Crazy Club events in Manitoba and sometimes in Saskatchewan. So I think we probably do have a few from Saskatchewan. So welcome. And you know, anyone's welcome from anywhere to to participate in these, of course. And uh, and thanks to Ducks Unlimited, they've kind of understood the link between agriculture, wildlife, habitat, and uh, have been funding the grazing clubs for over 25 years. Actually, I had a visit with Ken Gross from Ducks, and I think we're we're at like uh, 25 years now, so it's uh, pretty impressive. Just a sec here. There we go. Um, yeah, so if you do talk to someone from Ducks, just give them a big thank you that um, they're supporting projects like this. And, and so this idea was um, Cameron's, got to give all the credit to Cameron here. And it's great that we're doing this. Last week we did a webinar on uh, watering systems, tonight's fencing and next Monday's forage establishment. I'll send out an email again, so you'll get that. Uh, and all of it will be recorded and put onto the Manitoba Grazing Club's YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out, um, yeah, take a look. There's, I think, some pretty good stuff there. Uh, so we're going to start. Uh, maybe just one other thing. I'll, uh, I'll mute everyone. But if you do have a question, you can just unmute and ask. Uh, any time is probably good. Or if you don't want to do that, just put your question in the chat and uh, I'll just make sure that all the questions get read out. But we'll have lots of time for discussion and questions. So what we're going to do this evening, our agenda is Cameron's going to start with a few words about the Woodworth Grazing Club. And this evening, we're fortunate to have Trent Alexander and Sean Anderson. So thanks guys for being willing to do this. They're going to talk about what they're doing and why and answer questions and then we're going to have ryan canart from the watershed and ian fortune from mhhc talk about some of the funding opportunities like there's never been more money out there for funding things like water systems fencing forage establishment and just as an example the uh the program through the feds on farm climate action fund money is being delivered through the um, watershed and there's money for improved grazing management everything that we're going to talk about these three weeks in a row but it's also things like reducing nitrogen fertilizer and implementing cover crops so you know take advantage of all that make a plan and talk to groups like the watersheds mhhc ducks unlimited there's uh, like i say never been more money available so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Cameron. He's going to say a few words about the Woodworth Grazing Club. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what Michael said, this there's so much funding out there, and it kind of came. This idea came from talking to Michael and Ryan Kennard there that you know to get need to get the word out that there's all this funding. If you're basically wanting to do something, contact your watershed or somebody else that might have some funding. Um, yeah, and I'd just like to thank everyone for coming on tonight. I know everyone's busy and and uh, hopefully we can generate some conversation and answer some of your questions and maybe, you know, generate discussion. We can all learn some. So just a little bit about our grazing club right there. You can see the, that yellow star. That's the, the metropolis of Lenore and that's kind of where we, we hang our hat. And we've been lucky enough to do some annual a summer tour, a fall tour, and a winter meeting, and you usually get together and learn something from a, a neighbor, and it's usually a really good time. Um, I'm just gonna have to move over here and get Trent's PowerPoint up and going here. Trent Alexander is a, a neighbor from Lenore here, and he's part of our, what do you call it, Trent? Grazing Club Executive. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let Trent introduce himself. My name is Trent Alexander. I've been farming three miles west of Lenore for going on 11 years. Um, I operate a mixed farm with my parents. We have about 130 cows that we're calving out. We started calving, I guess, a couple of days ago. But just two on the ground there right now, but we're just getting rolling. And we got about 1,000 acres of arable land 
that's uh crop and hay. I didn't, didn't include the pasture and didn't really figure that number in, but uh, yeah, so that's what we do on the farm there. Um, I guess I've been interested in region ag for a number of years. Uh, I was trying to get that kind of figured out and then I head wrapped around it. I've, uh, I think getting, getting a handle on some of it now, it's still a, a pile of stuff to figure out, but um, yeah, I was always trying to learn something new that way. And that's where things like this, the grazing club tours and, and all those kinds of things are really, really good. Able to talk to some people and, and learn stuff every time you're out. That's why it's good to do these kinds of things, I guess. Um, next I have why I'm using temporary fencing. I was trying to make better use of the forage I have available and what else did I say before? Get uh, get the cows over over the land in a in a way that allows more rest for every paddock that I have. And by giving it more rest, it gives it a chance to uh, regenerate and uh, build build soil health up as they go through the summer. Um, next. So I <clears throat> try to use the cows to cover the soil and improve soil health. On the, the slide on the left there, you can see my shovel. That's in the middle of a, a, a poly crop I had there in the summer of 2022. That's just showing showing just how how tall that stuff was before the cows were into it, and the the slide on the left or on the right, I should say, just a, a comparison there showing what I'm trying to get the cows to do as they <clears throat> graze every every paddock. In that particular field, I was I think grazing three days per per uh, fence I was setting up, so that was about as much much time as I want to spend on there. Um, three days is usually usually the maximum I, I do per paddock just to uh, that's the point where a lot of grasses start to regrow and try and avoid grazing them twice or grazing them just as they're starting to grow again because that's that is uh, a deterrent in uh, improving soil health typically. Uh, next I had this is a, a video I had but I guess it's maybe not going to work tonight. I just show one showing moving these cattle um but uh yeah that's my cows i guess <laughs> not really much to say there um and here <clears throat> i have a few examples of the um the way i, I moved my cows i had a yeah i kind of had it so the lines would appear and reappear there but now they're maybe not gonna do that tonight either for us but that's okay i just shows <clears throat> that the black lines are my temporary fencing and the red lines there are permanent fencing. And you just see, I have an alleyway that runs back to my yard there that lets the cows go back for water as, as they need it, obviously. Um, and then the ones that are running up and down are the ones I'm using to divide my paddocks off. So with this system, I can make my paddocks as wide or as narrow as I want, depending on available forage that year. I typically try to, I don't do it's, Again, one to three days per per paddock. So that size varies between an acre to probably close to three acres per per paddock. Um, I guess yeah. So as as I go, the first fence would be the very far right one, and the alleyway goes right to the end there. And then the first fence goes up. And then as they've done that, well, I usually set up. I guess I should say set up uh, two or three fences at once going up and down. So I set up two going up and down, and then as they get done, the one, I'd move them around, around the end at the, the bottom there and put them into the next paddock. And then just run, you see the little black, black lines go across the alleyway um, at the bottom. And that's just me moving the, the reel from the end of the paddock to the, the permanent fence to put power to it again. And then I'd <clears throat> remove the, the fence that goes left and right there to let them into that paddock. And then just keep going down the field that way to uh, get my number of days on that particular system. I, I like that one. I mean, lots of guys, the alleyway maybe isn't the best setup, but it's working for me. So I kind of just keep doing it that way. Try to change change the time I'm grazing it every year and change the the uh, order I'm grazing 
the fields in too. So it's uh, just to keep things different. Try not to graze at the same same dates every year, I guess. And I'll go on to my next little system I use here is the spoke wheel. And so you can see in the middle there, I have a I have a dugout, and I, often I'll have a a temporary water system set up there to pump water water out of the dugout into a trough. Um, it usually works fairly well as long as you keep the solar all working and keep it keep it going that way. Keeps the water a lot cleaner for the cows. I guess we talked about that last week, so I won't go into depth too much in that. Um, in this in this particular field, I usually have the cattle coming. Again, the red's temp or permanent fencing and the black is is temporary. The cattle usually come in on the top left there, um, and then I just set up again three three temporary fences there. In a in a spoke wheel pattern, as as they go, I just move them move them around the end either end of the of the temporary fence, and uh, take the lot the one ahead of it or the one the first one down and move it to be the third one, and keep going around this this particular field in or this particular pasture in the in that way. Um, <clears throat> I guess the one thing about the the spoke wheel is you get kind of you can sometimes get uneven grazing where it gets narrow there. But it's um, and they don't graze as well away from the water system either. But it's again, it's something that's working for me in that one. Um, so that's kind of what I, what I've been doing there. And again, I don't graze it the same. I might go counterclockwise one year and clockwise the next year, or change the size of the paddocks and all that kind of jazz just to, uh, like I say, change it up all the time. Um. Next, I have stuff about the equipment I use. Um, for a couple of years, I, I'd done this right at the start and I had some not so great stuff <laughs> to, to try to make this all work. And it was, uh, took a lot of time to move fences and it was pretty frustrating. It just about made me not want to do it anymore. So I invested invested a bunch of money in uh, some better stuff. That's, that, there's a, a geared reel. I recommend those geared reels. They sure make life a lot easier. I had one that wasn't geared and it, uh, I'm I'm got pretty tired cranking it by the end, and I prefer I I like the ring top posts. I know lots of guys prefer the pigtail ones. I know Cam Cam likes the pigtails more than the ring top. I think. Yeah, he's saying he he could he could do either way. Then I always says, but I, I don't know. I like them. They don't tangle quite as much as the pigtails, maybe. Um, so they're handy that way, and I don't know. They just seem. Almost easier to use for me than the, than the pigtails are. Uh, and next, I got <clears throat> one of the ones I like the most are these <laughs> alligator clip wires. I know you can you can buy them uh, name brand ones that are probably better than those, but I just go to to uh, an automotive place and get a couple of pigtails and make make some wires up, and they seem to do not too bad a job for what I what I need. I just hook that those up to usually my um, high tensile wire. And then clip the other end on, onto the poly wire, and it seems to work not too terrible. It keeps the cows in anyway. I learned pretty quick you got to get um, those rubber caps on them, or else you get zapped <laughs> quite a bit, and it hurts. Um, and then the last last thing I have there is uh, a ground rod, and that's a pretty pretty important piece of equipment when you're doing any kind of electric fencing. Um, I'm pretty sure Sean would frown on some of the stuff I do. Make, making my grounds work, but they they do the job. I don't, usually don't pound them in near far enough, and I might move the posts around, so they're obviously not in as far as they should be. But uh, I don't know; seem, seem to work for me. And most days, cows don't get out. Uh, that's the odd day, I guess. But that's that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of what I had for my little spiel there. Um, I guess put out. The, uh, any any questions? Yeah, anyone has a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself. I muted everyone, so unmute yourself and uh, ask Trent a question. I'll start. Uh, on that first pasture you showed Trent with the um, the long, narrow, rectangular paddocks is there is there a thought behind making them like more rectangular long than say more square 
Um, I guess that's kind of just the where where an acre worth out on that field, but it's um, I guess you probably get more animal impact, right? On on them when they're narrower, so you're you're getting more hoof action, and your cattle are making a better job of what what you're trying to do when they're when they're a lot narrower, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. You get better um, animal impact, and if if one of your goals is to try to get good, you know, soil coverage, good soil armor, then that's the way to do it is make the paddock long and narrow and you get more movement of the cattle back and forth to do that job as as opposed to if you make it more square you probably get less uh, animal yeah your cattle definitely spread out more right away like usually when i let them into a pack they're uh, one lead cow will take them to the end and start working their way back or they'll right go to the end and back and then actually decide to graze yeah you got it yeah the narrower you are the, the more more that you're getting for sure Anybody question? Well, I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end, but we could continue with uh, Sean. And like yeah, I say, if you want, if you want, throw your questions in the chat, and I'll read them. Oh, here we go. We got a question. Uh, do you make the alleyway? on the same side every year, or do you try to switch it up? I've been putting it on the same side every year. I know that's maybe kind of a, a bit of a no-no. I, I, I would like to switch it up, but it's just kind of the way that the fence is and the, <clears throat> where the cow will have to go back for water. It's kind of hard to put it the other side. I'd have to, uh, I guess, pound some more pose. There it's Next to that, can you go back to that slide? Yeah. I can't. Um, sure. just uh, there's there's a slough that's next to that that particular alleyway on the on the north side of it or on the west side of it. So it's um my options are fairly limited on that paddock. I do put it on the same side every year, but if I had an option, I would I would change it for sure because it's not uh, not ideal, but <laughs> but really, you know, just working with what you have, it's probably the best scenario. So you, you maybe sacrifice a little bit because of, you know, the extra impact, but. Yeah, it gets pretty beat sometimes, but it's, like I say, that's, it's almost, almost impossible to fence it any other way, right. generally. I, I, the thing to do would be to get a more, another water source out there or something just to, uh, a more central water source would be the way to, to make that a more, viable way of doing it yeah yeah another question are your paddocks tame or native um those the two that i showed there i guess the the uh spoke wheel one was native and the alleyway one is on a on a tame it was well, been tame for a lot of years so i guess it's, it's probably getting close to what you would almost consider native but there's alfalfa and stuff in it yet it was an old, an old hay field so a bit of both <laughs> A bit of both yeah and uh i don't know i think it's yeah have, have a bit of both question from slade any thoughts on a water pipeline out to the paddocks and eliminate the alleyway that would be the way to do it for sure yeah i think it'd be a matter of um getting a system in there to, to do it and that would be yeah probably be able to eliminate the, the uh, alleyway or change the alleyway to wherever you want it every year, right? Right. It would be def definitely beneficial. Um, just haven't really got around to that yet. I think that's sort of a trade-off where you have to, you know, operate in the real world. There's a cost to that and it has to have a, you know, return on investment. So that- I guess if, if that was the only thing holding me back and that was the reason I wasn't doing it, it uh, yeah doesn't, doesn't really add up either. I, I'm, I'd rather- do it imperfectly, then uh, not do it at all. Right. Yep. Uh, another question: Do you use solar fencer for a permanent fence or a plug-in fencer for the whole thing? I've been using um, solar fencers. Uh, they seem to do the job. It's not not a, a huge area, so it covers it pretty not bad. I got a a better fencer last year, and that really made a difference to what's what the fence was carrying the um 
the one fence there is a, a high tensile, two strand high tensile fence. And then I was running, I run, run power down it and I just run all my poly wire off, off of that right. just to uh, get better power. There's barbed wire on two, two sides of there too. And it's, it's holding up, but can't, I can't run any, any power down that very well, but uh, yeah, a bit of both. Um, I don't, ha I don't have a plug-in fencer for it, but uh, like I say, working with what I got there at the moment and it uh, seems to be holding on anyway. The cows respect the fence pretty good once they're, once they're taught it. And once they have a chance to learn it, you can't uh, say the odd, odd time the wire will fall down. They, they uh, won't even walk over it just because they're so trained to it. So it's kind of a, I don't know, once the cows are onto it, they're not bad. Yeah, I think whether it's solar or you know, plug in power. It's just to have plenty of punch so that they do respect it. Yeah, exactly. If you can keep it light, hot enough, they, uh, yep. it, they don't mess with it. Yeah. As, as, uh, Rex used to say, power, 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 you want <laughs> lots of power. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so um, we can maybe continue. Thanks, Trent, and we'll keep going with uh, sure, Mike. Ron. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Trent. Just bear with me. I'm just loading Sean's PowerPoint here, I hope. I hope. I can see it. You can see it? Full yep. screen? Uh, it's not in present, it's not in like PowerPoint present mode, but it, it's good enough. We can just go with that. Yeah. Uh, I think I can, I think I figured out how to s somehow switch swap it here last time. Um, the Ryan Boyd was really helping me out there. Oh yeah. Behind the scenes. There, oh, there we go. We got her. All right. <laughs> All this figured out by three Thanks. weeks from now. Thanks, Ryan. So we got Sean Anderson. He's from PWR Fencing, and he does some custom grazing at home in his own place. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself. And don't be afraid to uh, ask questions for these fellows. We've got them here. I'm trying to pump them full a little bit of beer so they they get really loose lit. So well, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Cameron said, my name is Sean Anderson, and uh, along with my wife, we own and operate PWR Custom Fencing. We started in 1999. Um, out of necessity, we were, I was actually farming with my dad and brother just southwest of here, actually, in the Assiniboine Valley, and uh, just wasn't enough acres to generate enough income, income for three entities, so we decided to uh, venture out in this world of custom fencing i actually had a prof at olds college and he would go out fencing for a couple months in the summer and he was this rather large fellow and i thought well if he can pull this off in a two-month period we should be able to do something in a nine to ten month period and that's what we've been doing since 99 so we're we're heading into our 24th season um of fencing and uh we're suppliers for roblin forest products cap solar gallagher uh, electric fencing and just the most recent addition is farm simple uh, which is water monitoring and temperature monitoring uh, they're out of um, Saskatchewan so um, so yeah the reason that prior to starting PWR the reason that we my dad had actually used electric fencing back in 1967 when he moved back to the farm we had a bunch of, we had a uh, sow ferret finish operation and our barn was in terrible shape. And so dad just moved all the sows outside and with one strand of electric fence and he kept the sows in while he renovated the barn. And and then from there, it kind of evolved to, you know, stubble grazing and, and uh, grazing hayland in the fall. And so we had, uh, dad had always been fairly open-minded to trying new things and uh, he kind of passed that on to us. And so then when the three of us were farming together, um, just again, out of necessity, we had all these ravine runs running in uh, into the valley at the top, top of the valley. And we would spend like 12 hours per ravine run just repairing the barbed wire 
you know, if not every spring, every other spring. And it just the frustration of it, we just realized there's got to be a different way or a better way. And so uh, it was around that time that I ran into Will Rex, who was the Gallagher rep at that time. And um, I'm not the quickest learner, but I went to three of his fencing schools and um, it just a light bulb went on. And, and we had been fooling around with uh, different brands of electric fencing over the over the years, but it was just the way Will presented it and, and the Gallagher product line. It was, here's a complete system. It works if you follow the same um, fundamentals every time it'll work. So, and then that evolved into us getting into custom fencing. So, um, so I guess um, just going at this from, from my profession of being a custom fencer, it's just, um, when you're when you're working with your own system where where do i start and you start with uh what kind of animals you're trying to manage manage whether it's cattle horses sheep whether you're trying to control predators for your honey yard or your your sheep or your cut or your uh, keeping the coyotes out of your sheep um or goats that that affects what style of fence you build the amount of power you need etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you ask yourself is it is it a permanent or a temporary fencing situation like Trent alluded to he's working with what he's got so he's got you know a mix of barb and electric and the the cross fencing the temporary fencing that's an awesome tool for um getting into into electric fencing but it's also an awesome tool to kind of cash flow this this new um style of fencing um and so then you, you you need to know how many acres you're working with because electric fencing, actually the way we size uh, the energizer is based on the number of acres, not the miles of fence. Um, and then it's like buying a computer. Uh, you think forward into the future, how many other acres am I gonna add to this um, total project? And if you can go up in size on your energizers, you should. Uh, or if you can do it right away, that's the best time to do it. Um, and then you want to know if you if you got hydro available, is this going to be a, 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 a you know one ten volt system or is it going to be a solar system? So, and then what's your budget? Your budget obviously affects um, the product. So, um, I'm going to just quickly summarize how electric fencing works because the theory of electric fencing is critical. If you don't understand that, then the rest of what you're doing is kind of uh, mute. So basically in a nutshell, the current flow leaves the energizer going down the fence. The animal touches the, the wires, the current flows through the body of the animal into the grass and the roots of the grass, which in turn transfers it to the mineral content in the soil. And that is key. And from there, the current migrates its way back to the ground stake system. So your ground stake system acts like a great big fishnet trying to capture that returning voltage. And the ground rods capture that returning voltage and send that power back into the energizer. And that's when the shock happens. And that all happens in a millisecond. So that current, when it leaves the energizer, if there's no cow touching the fence or there's no tree on the wire it's just statically sitting there it's very similar to if you have a water system and you put a pressure gauge on the end of your garden hose um and and you've got 40 psi at your pump you in time you might have 50 60 psi at the end of your garden hose but the minute you crack that valve it just equalizes so the current doesn't actually flow back to the energizer until an animal or something is touching that wire, pushing it back down to the ground. Um, voltage, everybody, yeah, I talk to guys and they're like, well, my fence should be working fine because I got 8,000 volts. So voltage is just a measure of pressure. It's, it's like an RPM gauge on your tractor. It's just an indicator of how your system is working. Um, current or amps is the measure of flow and stored joules is the amount of power or the horsepower that you have in your system. 
So if you have a 20 joule energizer, that's the horsepower. You hook it up to your fence and you're putting out six to 8,000 volts. Um, that's, you're doing well. If you're measuring your amps with a fault finder and you're putting out 8,000 volts and it's idling at say 25 to 30 amps, you're great, everything's good. If you go out the next day and you test the fence and you've got 50, 60, 80 amps of current flow and your voltages drop down to say one to two kV or 2000 volts, you got a problem. You got to chase that down and figure out where that current is flowing because you're losing current um, to a fault somewhere along your fence line. So, um, yeah, it's just those are the definitions of of uh, of how that voltage current and store joules. Those are the key things that you need to know when you're working with electric fence, whether it's solar or plug in power. So voltage and joules, just like I was saying earlier, voltage is just a measurement of of uh, of how your system is operating. So we've got this little lawn tractor on the left. It's only a 16 horsepower tractor and it's got to put out 2700 RPM to produce that 16 horsepower. You can have 2700 RPM on this larger 230 horsepower tractor and it's night and day difference. The amount of power um, that you can, what you can do with that tractor versus the lawn tractor. So it's the same with your energizers. Um, you, you size them according to your acres and then from there, um, if you can go up in power, you should. And then the next part is, uh, this is this is where 90% of your problems will come from is improper grounding. Um, so the rule of thumb is for every uh, five stored joules, so that 20 joule energizer I was just talking about, you divide that by five. So you basically need five and a half ground rods so just round up and go to six ground rods and you can see just below the don't sign there is a is a picture of a ground rod that's a gallagher ground rod um and with electric fencing the current actually flows on the surface of the wire so industry we use 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire it flows on the outside of the wire not internally and the same thing when that current flows back through the mineral content of the soil and it comes to these ground rods, it flows on the surface, the outside surface of these ground rods. So a Gallagher ground rod has three times the surface area as a seven eighths utility ground rod that um, you would get at your hardware store for your domestic hydro setup or like if you're putting a, a ground rod in with your water bowl and stuff like that. This, these ground rods have three times the surface area. So if you wanna use the 70s utility ground rods, I don't recommend it, but if you do, then it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you have a 28 joule energizer, you're gonna need 28 of those ground rods. Um, so basic rules of thumb, you got four meters between these stakes. Uh, you need three of them minimum for any any energizer that's larger than 10 joules, you're going to need three of them. Um, they should be two meters in length, and you've got one continuous wire starting at the very last ground rod coming all the way back to the energizer. They're all joined um, in series, and they, that's how you get the power back into your, your energizer. Um, so for those of you that are using rebar, that's meant for construction. Um, you, you, you want to use galvanized wire, galvanized ground rods. Do not mix different metals because you get meteorology and, and arcing starts to happen between uh, at your connection. So um, that's, that's everything in a nutshell, um, like a real small nutshell here. So I'm a big fan of question and answers because you guys have all joined this uh, Zoom show for a reason you've got your own questions so let's just get to them and i'll answer them as they come up hey we've got a few already here um how about depth of ground rod i think you did mention that two meters yeah so the gallagher ground rods are seven feet long you want to bury them as far into the ground as you can yeah. um 
if if you uh, want to keep the wife happy and she's not going to hit them with the mower, then you can even dig a trench and, and put them subsurface a little bit. Um, that's a great way of doing it too. So I usually, so I'll have my, the energizer itself, I'll have say in a building, if it's a 110 powered thing, do not put the ground rods under the eaves because the water coming off the eaves will leach the mineral content of the soil. And that mineral content is actually what the current flows on. It's not moisture. Moisture is just like grease on a bearing. That's all it does. So the mineral content of the soil is what conducts the current flow. So um, that that's what you do. So I, I usually leave the building and I go to the, my first section of fence and I bury or I pound the those ground stakes parallel underneath the bottom wire and they're kind of tucked out of the way and you're not going to mow them and stuff like that. So, right, good. Um, why are copper ground rods not recommended? Again, because you've got meteorology, right? So you're mix, you're hooking up your ground, um, your your galvanized wire to a copper ground where you're going to have corrosion start to happen, and yeah. if you've got corrosion, you've got resistance. So, what if you use copper wire? Right. So don't you mix could, your metals. Yeah, you could use copper wire. Uh, Trent was just ask, asking that. Actually, what I use for my ground wire, I use Gallagher's undergate cable. That's it's a twelve and a half gauge galvanized wire, but it's got an aluminum coating. So, an aluminum wire will conduct three times the current flow that a twelve and a half gauge galvanized wire will conduct. So, if you've got a three strand perimeter fence, this high conductive cable, aluminum coated is equal to those three strands of wire as far as current flow goes. So I use those for the ground rods as well because it's likened to driving to town on a two lane highway and coming home on the dirt road. You, it, you want that power to go out fast and you want it to come back as fast as it went out. And it, it allows it to be a powerful shock that way as well. Okay, good. Can you comment on tube insulators? Tube insulators? Yep. Yeah, I don't use them. They're, if you don't set the depth of your uh, staple correctly, um, if, if you put your staple in too deep, it's gonna wear through that tube insulator and it's gonna start to short out between the staple and the mineral content of the post because the posts are treated posts, have copper sulfide treat in them. And um, so, and then the other thing is you've got to load them before you, so you got to know how many posts you've got and, and load them on the wire as you're going. So it's just, it's an inefficient way of, of building fence. We just use the claw type insulators and we use double headed nails to install them. And the reason I use double headed nails is because we also custom graze ourselves. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of gates, so, because gates, you've got to put under gate cable. It's an added expense. We've got hunters in our area and they put their orange hat on and they think they're entitled to go where they want. And so I use the least amount of gates as possible and I lift my wires and my cat, I've trained my cattle to go underneath the lifted wire. So I can take a pair of pliers or my Leatherman that I've got on my belt and I can pull that double headed nail out after I've shut the power off on the fence with my remote and I can turn that insulator sideways, pull that wire out and then I can lift it, move the cattle, put it all back together, start the fence back up again with the remote and move on, so. Okay, good. Uh, we have sheep and use seven strand electric alternating ground and hot, 9,000 volts. Any ideas to make it better yeah or other, say, or other ideas yeah. i would say i i always i'm not a fan of the hot ground system and and the reason for that is because uh if you can grow grass you can conduct current so um the reason i'm not a fan of the hot ground system is because if the if the hot wire touches your ground wire now you got a short now when you say hot ground uh wire most people don't actually uh, like your ground wire should be in an insulator as well. Like your your strands of ground should ground wire should be in insulators, and you should run a second undergate cable at each and every gate 
to carry that current flow back to your ground stake system. So if you if you have to do it, like there are certain areas where you can't, you know, if you're in sand hills and you can't, you know, conduct current very well, then yeah, that's a good option. But I would insulate each and every wire. And then what I would do is put one ground rod out at each section. So if it's a half mile or a quarter mile, put just one ground rod, with, which I'll call a reference ground rod, and you hook up your ground wires to that ground rod and it'll send the current back to your main ground stake system. But I'm a big fan of all hot um, and that you're gonna, you're gonna get better current flow from that. So I should, that's actually a great question. Um, so for every, for one strand of 12 and a half gauge wire on a mile, there's 56 ohms of resistance. Every strand that you add to that, you can divide it by the amount of strands you've added. So 56 divided by two, you're down to roughly 20, whatever that is, 28. Thanks, Trent. My gene, math genius is sitting beside me here. If you add three, now you're down to 19 and a half ohms of resistance. So that is likened to pumping water with a three inch hose versus a two inch versus a one inch. And you, at the start and end of every section, you join all three strands together on the middle wire and you put a joint clamp on there. And if it's a permanent situation, I even wrap the wires after that five or six wraps. So that's like pumping water with a three inch hose. You've got good current flow. So in your case with how many strands did they say they had seven, seven strands? You've got a you've got a, a super conducting feed fence there that is going to move a lot of current flow if they're all joined together. And then again, you got to make sure you got the correct amount of ground rods back at your energizer because you can send all that power out but if you're not capturing it when it returns there again you go to touch the fence and you say you think to yourself well, i've got eight thousand volts which is a measurement of how the fence is doing that doesn't mean that that cow is getting eight thousand volts and 28 joules of power because it takes very little current flow to light up that little tester so you want to make sure that your whole system is working properly and in concert with each other. Otherwise, that cow is only getting. So let's just say, for argument's sake, you have a 10 joule energizer, which takes three ground stakes. If you put a piece of rebar in, she's getting nothing, basically. Let's just call it. And you've wasted, you know, 800 bucks. You're only getting $80 of value out of that $800 energizer. Now, if you put even one ground rod in, one Gallagher ground rod, now you're getting a third of that power delivered out and back. If you do two, you know, you're getting two thirds of the power. So you're getting more power through. And the thing is, you don't really notice it until you get into a drought year. Well, if you're in a drought, obviously you're, you're and the, it's not the lack of moisture. It's the, the fact that the plants aren't growing thrifty and strong. And, they, and the, the root system isn't as, as vigorous as it would be during a wet year. And then in the wet year, you've got all this lush vegetative growth just sucking the life out of this energizer. So that's why we have to have the right amount of ground rods, lots of power, lots of good joint clamps and connections and everything, undergate cable, all of it working properly. Because now you're delivering, you know, 100% of that power down that fence and you're burning that vegetation off if you've got lush growth and uh, in a dry year, you're powering through that resistance of, of um, poor grass growth, if that makes sense. So I have a quarter section on my custom grazing where the energizer sits and there's a, uh, another quarter, kid, quarter that's kitty corner to it. And at the furthest point away from that energizer, I've got 22,000 kilovolts and at the energizer, I've got 11. Now, the reason that's that way is because there's hardly any vegetative growth in the sand hills on that piece of, on that quarter. So there's nothing sucking the life away from that energizer. But the minute I short that fence out or a cow touches that, it's gonna equalize out to 11,000 kilovolts, if that makes sense, so. There's another question there. Okay. Is, it, is there a max distance? All right. Next question, um, is there a maximum distance of ground rods to the energizer? So the, I, if I understand the question 
correctly, it's like, so if I put my energizer in the barn, how far away from the barn can I go before I put my ground rods in? And really that's unlimited. Like with that high conductive cable, they come in quarter mile spools, like the largest spool. So you could literally run it that far out. It, it wouldn't be as efficient maybe, but you theoretically could. So the, I would say, get it out to your first section of fence. If get it away from the eaves of the, of the building and get it out to where your first section of fence in, which is typically your corrals or something like that. You got high, you know, manure load, which is mineral, right? Um, so that's where you want to put it. Okay. So you have some flexibility with distance. Don't worry about it being right next to the fencer. I, I got a question to add to that one. I, I guess, I guess for me, Sean, like I'm moving my fencers quite often and I'm wondering, is there a way you can check to see in like in different soil types, how many ground rods you need? Like, is it, you're maybe too good in a wet area, but maybe you need three in a uphill or sandy. Is there a, a quick and dirty way? The quick and dirty way is follow the factor of five or three. So if you're in your case, um, are you, you're moving your cows as a mob? Yeah, and moving the fence or like probably three or four. Right, your right. Area. So Matt Van Steele and I, he kind of come up with this idea of wanting to be able to move his energizer with his mob group of cows. So we we set up a portable energizer cart for him, solar powered cart. And then he just plants uh, wherever he's, you know, if he's got a half section here and three quarters over there, each uh, grazing cell will have its own ground stake system there. And then he just moves the cart hooks up to that ground stake system and off he's running. But if you've got a 28 joule energizer, you need six ground rods, you know, at each grazing cell, but they're not expensive. Like for, for under 500 bucks, you can set up um, a grazing or ground rod system for each of those grazing cells. And then you're amortizing the cost of that energizer out over all your acres, not just that quarter or that half or, and, and you reduce the number of energizers you have. And then I was actually thinking about your thing there, Trent, too. Like, if you can eventually get to 110 power, because um, solar power, so for a 28 joule energizer, you're going to spend with solar and, and charge regulator and batteries and all that stuff. Like, we're talking a larger energizer here. You're going to sp be spending about 1100 bucks. Well, you can run almost three quarters of a, a mile of um, aluminum wire to get that current out from your main yard to wherever you need it. And then from there, you just build on it, right? Like if you if you didn't have, hypothetically, if you didn't have a fence leaving your yard and you had to build a new one, you could do it with a one strand aluminum wire and, and one strand of 12 and a half gauge. And now you've got four strands of current, like pumping current out there. And then from there, you just, that's called a feed line. And then from there, you just, split it off so that's actually a good point too is current balancing you always want the power to leave your energizer and never return except through the ground except through the soil so but current balancing specifically is if i have a quarter section i don't loop the current flow all the way around the quarter if my energizer is in the southwest corner of the quarter i'm going to send the power to the northeast corner of that quarter and stop but I'm going to send it both ways. So it's not two miles of fence. It's one mile of fence. So you're improving the efficiency or like you're, you're reducing the, um, resistance. the resistance on that system while still having a large energizer based on that acres, if that makes sense. So the wires don't connect at the, at the far corner is what you're saying. That's correct. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can do it on the. Okay. I think a lot of people, a lot of guys probably do that wrong. Yeah. I have my pink shirt on in, uh, for Valentine's Day. Charades, charades. I need my wife here for that.
So yeah. I don't know if they can see that or not. You'll have to come closer. Closer that way. There we go. That's good. See, so yeah, I drew quarter number one. The energizers in the south. We'll call it the southeast corner, southwest corner of the of that yep. first quarter, and the power flows both directions and it stops. The only right. that current returns is through the ground back to the ground rod system. And then if you've got a second quarter, you just add to it exactly like you did the first time. Yeah, exactly. So there's different configurations, but that's a simple example of current balancing. It's, it's like uh, a great way to think of current balancing is if you cut this great big oak tree down and you laid it down horizontally, you've got this great big trunk, which represents multiple layers, good feed lines, pushing with lots of current. And then from there, you can scale down. You can go from three strand to two strand down to one strand, but you've still got your current flow high. Okay, thanks. Uh, question, we have lots of old overhead aluminum hydro supply cable. I think I got that right. It would be about six to eight gauge. Would that work well? Um, yeah, in theory, it, in theory it should because it'll be a multi-strand cable. Like you're calling it six to eight gauge. I don't, I, I, if I understand that correctly, it's probably not a single strand of six to eight gauge wire. It's probably a multi woven right. aluminum wire. And that would work fine. Yeah. If you've got, it, and if it's uncoated, like if it's uh, just bare aluminum wire, that would probably work great for, for uh, getting the current out. So it's, it's a good question because I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Gallagher. I, it served me well. Um, but at the end of the day, I want to teach you guys the theory of how electric fencing works, and then you can make it work in your own situation. So another example for the ground rods, like you don't necessarily have to use the Gallagher ground stakes, but so if you had two and three eighths galvanized pipe, for example, from, you know, the chain link world, um, that would work as well. But cost wise, they're both about the same. Actually, the pipe is a bit more money. So, um, and Gallagher's got a clamp that's made to fit on their ground stakes. So it, I, I, I don't personally I'm here to reinvent the, the, the system. I, they've got a great system and, and I've used, I figured out how to work with it. So that's, I'm, I'm going out to make money. And it's the same thing on, on my own custom grazing operation. I, I have time to do it right once. I don't have time to come back a, a second time and correct it. So I'm going to do it what I think is right the first time and then move on and go to the lake and enjoy the family time. Yep. Good. That's um, all the questions that I see in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute, ask a question, go ahead. Otherwise we'll move on to Ryan and Ian. Is that yeah, right? Whoever wants to go first there. Sorry, I have one. I do have a question. Okay. Give her a call. Uh, when you're hooking up the your ground rods with the underground cable, are you stripping it where it attaches to the uh, to the ground rod? Is that how you're and then fasten it with the clamp? Yeah, that's correct. Good question. I should have should have explained that. I'm moving through my mind here quickly <laughs> i apologize but yeah exactly you strip it and you strip it at the end too where you put it into the terminal of the energizer um the same thing at the other end like if you, if you use an undergate cable to go underneath the gate you're gonna have to strip that coating off the easiest way to strip that coating is just to take a uh, an exacto knife and score it and then take your hammer and smash it against the post and it breaks the inside coating away from the 12 and a half gauge wire and then you just take your pair of pliers and pull it off i use the gallagher pliers uh those mon uh they're the mon brand is what they're called but they're gallagher sells them they're about 150 bucks but i can use them as a hammer i can use them to strip wire i can use them to put the nuts on for the uh, ground stake clamps like they're just a really handy tool so the only thing i and i can even score the that undergate cable with the the cutting 
players. You just got to be careful when you're doing it. That's all. But yeah, thanks for asking that, Colin. Thank you. Okay, who's going first, Ryan or Ian? Doesn't matter to me. I can go ahead if that works hey. for you, Ryan. Yep. Go ahead, yeah, Ian. Go um, do I just share my screen here, Michael? Or yep. Uh, yep. You can. Yep. Go ahead. Let me know if it's up there the way it's supposed to be. Okay, I see it. Uh, yeah, so it's Michael it's going right up there, start right there. Um, never been more money out there. Uh, lots of lots of money available for funding. Um, uh, through us at MHHC, we we deliver this funding through what's going on here. Going on here? Through uh, what we call grassland stewardship agreements, uh, GSAs. I'll refer to them as. Um, this funding and the the these agreements are you know they're aimed at just providing funding to support cattle producers to to keep grazing i guess uh keep those cattle on the landscape um cameron had asked a couple of weeks ago about a, a delivery area so so that's the del delivery area there um i don't have lenore marked off on a big nice star there but you'd be right in the heart of that um you can see there it's basically all of southwest manitoba um yeah ignore those numbers up there those are old i just don't maybe have the best PowerPoint skills of finding the right stuff to put on there. Um, on the right there is uh, is the is the pricing um, sheet. I guess a lot of you have likely seen on this call. Um, again, it it hasn't changed again this year from last year on what we are <clears throat> able to fund. You know, on per mile of fencing, uh, that kind of thing. Um, put that in for a bit of a plug on some of the other other BMPs that we can fund as well there, but uh, but you got your per mile for the different uh, types of fencing up right at the top, the first four lines there. Uh, these agreements are 10-year are agreements. Um, uh, basically, all they are is that the acres of grassland affected by the project are just to remain in grass for those 10 years. Um, there's nothing on titles. There's no, no caveats or anything like that. It's much more of a handshake deal, um, you know, less restrictive as, as, as that, and they've been a They've been a real good, uh, real good program here. The guys are really, really jumping on. So, um, if you are interested in any of this stuff, by all means, um, get a hold of us. Um, I know last week the comment came up about paperwork, and no one, no one likes paperwork. So, with these agreements through us, there is no paperwork on on the producer's part. Um, that's all taken care of by me. Basically, all all we would do is have a you know, uh, sit down or, you know, even, even chat over the phone on what you might be looking at, looking at doing, um, kind of put the project together and that, then I, I submit a proposal and this is just kind of the first few pages of a proposal here, um, showing what, what funding you're, you're kind of looking for, um, how it meets the criteria of the funders, draw out a map to show, to show actually what you're doing there. Um, there's a lot of other kind of maps that go into these proposals as well that, that I put in just uh, different GIS layers, basically showing how the project meets the meets the criteria of the funding. But, but again, that's all that's all on us. There's no no paperwork on uh, on the producer's part, and and no environmental farm plan is required for these either. I get that question a lot as well. So, so nothing nothing that way. It's all all very simple as uh, as far as the uh, producer is, is concerned, I guess. Um, once these projects, I guess, are completed or they're in, once, once they're completed, um, I just basically go out and take a couple, you know, pictures of, of the completed project and do up what we call here a verification report that we send in, um, just showing what, that the project has been completed, um, you know, the, the money that, that was, um, funded was, was actually used for, for what you said it was going to be used for um you get two grazing seasons to complete these projects so 
any anything you know this year that we might put in this year, you'd have until November fifteenth of twenty twenty four to uh, to complete. Um, so you got a bit of bit of time there. I mean, most have a plan in place that they're they're done within a year, but quite often we do we do see guys um, working into them that second year, depending on the size of the project and everything, of course. Um, if you look at this one here on that schedule A, I, the reason I included this one is if you look on, on this slide on the proposal, um, this, this producer uh, originally went or, or told me he was wanting to put, put barbed wire um, in where those yellow, those yellow lines are. And when he went to, to actually do the fencing, he, he called me and said, I changed my mind. I think I want to put um, electric fence in now, two strand electric. Can I do that? And I said, yes, that's no problem. Um, the only thing is I can't, we won't be able to pay the funding out at, at $4,900 a mile of uh, barbed wire where we'd have to be back down to the two, two strand electric fence. But I, I said, how about, is there any other fencing you want to do on this quarter um, that we could get that back up to the, the amount funded? And he said, oh yeah, I can, I could put fencing <laughs> all over on that really. So he did add, add some more fencing in and added, um, um, a solar energizer system as well too that we are able to to bring this project back up to the the original dollar amount so just kind of highlight that uh, you know things are always in motion and uh, you know once once a proposal's in and, and approved and signed and that kind of thing it's not like you're you're stuck to what you said you did if, if plan or what you wanted to do if if your plans do change um, there there is that flexibility there so. Uh, these are a couple other just examples now of, of some projects we've done. Um, on the left there, there was three strand electric uh, perimeter fencing that um, was put into this quarter. It was it was an annual crop and, and uh, the farmer took it out of, out of annual crop and put it into pasture. Um, and then those those orange lines in the middle are just temporary single strand electric. Um, actually the, the, the one strand along the bush line there was permanent one strand electric there. He pounded a few posts in and put uh, put one strand in there. And then those other those other three lines are just temporary electric. So they, you know, obviously those might not be where where that temporary fencing goes in, but we just kind of draw those lines on there to to show the number of miles of, of fencing that that you're looking for, kind of thing. Uh, on the right, I know last week again. Um, Someone had mentioned something about fencing, fencing a dugout out, off, or or wanting to do that. So here's an example of a project where we've we've done that. Um, not a big project. I think it was you know a quarter mile or under a quarter mile of fencing that we funded there. But I mean, you got you got about a thousand bucks to put in, put in fence around the dugout, and then also funded the uh, the water system to to keep the you know water the cows up on the hill away from the dugout there, and just keep them out of out of the dugout. <clears throat> so lots of different options that. Uh, you know, you can you can look at here um, anything anything you're looking at. But like I said, by all means, give us a call. We'll go over it and uh, and see if uh, if we can't make something work. Here's a few pictures of just you know when I go out to do these verification reports. Um, you know what? I guess an example of projects we've done. These are these are all projects we've done over the past. Past year or two here, um, different different types of fencing, you know, different different scenarios. Um, top right there, where they're they're clearing some some bush to to put a fence line in there. Um, bottom right, if you look again, that where that old fence is going up, it it goes up and around the slough up in the top of the picture there. And I think I drew the the lines on the proposal, kind of following that old fence and where he went to put the new fence in, just you know, pounded a nice straight line out to the corner of the slough and, and up the other way. But, uh, you know, again, nothing, nothing is really set in stone. It's all, it's all, you know, can be changed once we get to that verification report um, part two. And yeah, I guess, you know, doing those verification reports, well, obviously the, some of the temporary fencing isn't in when, when those are completed. So again, there's just, uh, you know, another way of saying, well, he, this you know this producers bought the bought the supplies that he had said he would and used the funding so you know just kind of proving that that's that's the case and uh, and yeah um, 
it's it's a pretty pretty simple procedure really um and like i said pretty pretty non-restrictive um and and a lot of money out there so if if uh if you are looking at doing any any projects, especially fencing wise like this, like I said, get a hold of us or, or the watershed or whoever it might be, and I'm sure that you know between one of us we'll we'll make something work for you hopefully here. So that's all I got for for now anyway. Okay, thanks, Ian. Any questions for Ian? Um, got a question here. Yeah, is there any minimum number of head to qualify? Of livestock, I guess is what. Right. Uh, no, there's no no minimum number of head. Um, some of these agreements, depending on the funding funding source, they do ask for um, the number of head, and they just you know it, there there's no there's no minimum or maximum or, or anything like that. Um, what we're what we're looking for is um, what we have to report on. I guess I should say is the acres of grassland that are that are considered these affected acres, um, you know, essentially in included in these in these 10 year agreements. Right. Another question, is there any potential to use the MHHC program to replace old fence lines? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, I think if you noticed in, in a couple of those pictures, um, old fence line beside it. Um, yes, it's, it's, it is totally geared towards this, um, you know, Getting that infrastructure out there, whether it's whether it's new or or replacing old stuff, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Any other questions? Uh, minimum makers to qualify. Um, again, not really a minimum acres. It just the the acres kind of have to make sense to the amount of funding we're looking for, requested kind of thing. Right. Um, so talk to you, and you can kind that's of right. figure that out. That's right. We can take a look at the project and and at the uh, and at the you know the piece of land and that 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 you're looking at doing it on and that kind of thing. Right. Um, one thing I do get is um, wondering about you know fencing fencing ravines and stuff like that. So they are looking for, you know, more blocks of grassland, whether it be 40 acres or, or more or whatever. It doesn't, like I said, the, the acres don't really matter per se as, as much as just matching it to, to make sense with the, with the amount of funding requested, I guess. But, okay. but if you have a bunch of, you know, ravines that you're looking at fencing inside, inside annual cropland, um, those, those tend not to be, not to be approved. And, um, like I said, just looking for looking for more more grassland acres. All right, sounds good. Uh, what do we got here? Can funding be used for custom grazing? Example: renting out pasture to other producers. Yes. Yep. And there's two different ways we can do that. Um, either the the landowner themselves, if they are renting land out, can do the you know the agreement and, and the funding would be paid to them or the renter can can do it and we would just need a uh, and pay the money to the renter um we would just need a consent form signed by the by the landowner yeah. to to show right. that they understand that this this agreement is going in place yeah so there's some flexibility there depending on what the arrangement is okay right uh is there a maximum dollar amount per quarter Yes, there at the moment we are able to do thirteen thousand per quarter, and up to fifty thousand per landowner. Okay, good. That's very generous. Uh, are producers allowed to use MHHC funded programs while existing CEs are um, with other entities on the land? I guess they're asking if you got a C. If you got an existing conservation agreement, would this still be eligible? Uh, or are we still have to go through with the CE, who the CE is signed with? I'm not, did you follow that, Ian? Uh, I think what, I guess what I'm, what I'm seeing there is, is if you have a, a, an easement signed with another entity other than MHHC, can you right. still sign these funded programs with us? And the answer to that is yes, um, we can do that now. 
Um, I know in the past, I think we weren't able to do that, but now there is a there is a memorandum of understanding, I think, between between us and other, you know, like Ducks Unlimited and that kind of thing that that we can we can do that. Good. That kind yeah, of thing it, now. That that makes sense to me because you're still doing good things on the land. Right. Regardless of who has the conservation agreement. Right. Yep. Yeah. Good. Um, can you put your contact info in the chat? So yeah, if you just want to sure, type I'll in your cell phone or email. You bet. I can do Thanks. that before. Yep. And then last question here. Can you use the program to graze annual crops? Example, swath grazing. So I guess the answer, the probable answer to that is no. Um, because the criteria needs um, acres of grassland, like perennial perennial grassland to be included um, right. as part of those agreements. So, I mean, if you had a quarter with 80 acres of grass on it or something, and then the other 80 acres was annual crop and you fence the whole quarter, we could probably make something like that work. But you, there, there does need to be um, you know, a certain number of acres of, of perennial grass that, that are included in these agreements. Okay, that makes sense again too. I think, you know, because that, that annual crop land that could be used for grazing could take the pressure off the perennial and it would just make for better overall habitat, right? Right, right. Okay. Good. Um, any other questions? We can always take a few more at the end too. So maybe we'll just, Move on to Ryan. Can you hear me, Ryan? Gotcha. Okay. I share my screen. Yep. My super cow here. Yep, got it. Awesome. Let me try to. Okay. Yep, so looks good. Everybody, I don't know how many people are on here from last week. It's going to be more or less the same show. Um, the program I'm going to talk about specifically is the, the Prairie Watershed Climate Program. The, the two big drivers of that program are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to increase carbon capture. Not carbon capture and storage like the big expensive programs they do with the oil companies, but store more carbon in the soil as far as the rotational grazing piece goes. So I throw this slide up there just to show we're somewhere in the middle of that. I would think we, we probably lost half of our carbon since we started tipping the prairie 100 plus years ago. Um, so we're driving our agricultural soils in a downward direction like this kind of graph graphic shows. So the grazing program is a good one. And, and you know, we can use grazing animals and the impact of grazing to reverse the impacts to the to the soil. There's some research that now supports this concept. So what you're looking at here is, is a couple of graphs that show the stocking to grazing ratio. If you can get that ratio spread out where there's a lot of rest compared to grazing and then add your higher stock densities, you can drive your carbon sequestration up. The AH layer, you can drive it up in higher. And that's kind of the precursor to, to putting carbon into the soil, leaving that material on the surface. We've all seen this. I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, there's a shot of my place. So I do a lot of this stuff to you guys that we're talking about it all night. The yellow being temporary wires and red being internal hard permanent fences. And uh, I enjoy it. I think there's a big benefit to doing it. So it's nice to see a program like ours and Ian's come along now that can really support these uh, efforts. Um, so yeah, fencing out Douglas, we talked about this water quality when that was the topic of, of interest last week. But again, we, we get a lot of projects where guys want to get a water system in place and fence out dugouts. Um, here's a shot of an image. We, we've also got the opportunity with some other programming to recognize the benefits of maybe leaving cattle out of certain fragile, sensitive parts of the landscape. So this project just shows that the producer intends to put up a, a fence and maintain some habitat quality in that creek system and, and he'll get paid per acre per year to do that. So on top of the infrastructure required with fence and water systems, you can also now pay for um, a bit of the ecological benefit that is derived from keeping cattle out of sensitive areas. The grazing forward program um, 
is a, a program. It's a neat one that's come out with Alice and it will pay producers for a period of five years to recognize the effort that is required to do some higher level grazing practices. We're still trying to um, kind of tweak and put some changes to the application form here, but this one will be coming out fairly shortly. So we want to, we want to find a bunch of producers that are, that are grazing at a fairly high level, you know, daily moves, high stock densities, quite long rest periods. Those are the metrics we'll use to, to kind of rank and, and um, qualify producers into the program. But if you're at all interested in something like this, maybe please reach out to me. The one I do want to focus on, though, like I mentioned, is the Prairie uh, Watershed Climate Program. Lots of funding here to support grazing efforts. Um, tonight, specifically fencing we're talking about. So I put that number of 15000 per quarter in. I think um, what Ian showed with the cost shares on the different kinds of fencing in the 13000 per quarter section is, is where we sit today. Um, and we tried... That, that wasn't kind of an accident. We got together with the folks at MHHC and, and wanted to kind of create a couple of programs that had an equal playing field. We didn't want, you know, our, our program a little bit uh, better or their program a little bit better. So we, we took that concerted effort to try to make the programs um, equal across all different opportunities there for producers. So 15 may, we may jump it up a little bit to 15 per quarter. But I think at thirteen to fifteen thousand per quarter, it's it's almost getting hard to spend that kind of money unless you're really going crazy. There are there's funding for the water systems, but also the fencing. And so, like the the slide that Ian showed with the cost breakdowns per type of fence, we've we adopted that exact uh, cost ratio or or cap on, on the funding. Um, one that maybe we didn't talk about so much was we can increase the, the pasture composition, increase the diversity, put some new plants into a tired old um, alfalfa or, or a grass pasture system, and we can pay up to $35 an acre to do that. And then also with the creation of a rotational grazing plant. So our program requires the producer, the applicant to give a rotational grazing plan, especially with the more elaborate um and cost if like higher cost projects so if you're putting a single cross fence in you know a $2,500 single cross fence in that that's not going to require a very robust grazing plan but if you're asking for you know the top end of 13 to 15,000 per quarter then we're gonna we're gonna expect to see a little bit more of a upscale uh rotational grazing plan and if you want help with that there's guys that are becoming grazing mentors. Cam will know some of them, and and there's also programs online we can we can help cost share with you if you're gonna take something like that with, through. Understanding Ag has one, and there are others out there. So those are kind of the four main categories under the this Prairie Watershed Climate Program. It, there's a lot of funding here, so um, I hope everybody that's interested maybe up taking some of these practices. Definitely, like I said, give Ian, give myself a call. There's it's a good time. There's lots of funding to support the um, healthy management of grasslands. So that's it. Our application form is similar to Ian's. It's not very, we've, we've made efforts to make it pretty painless on the producer's end. And some of that stuff about the annual payments, we don't even mention that in the upfront application process. We, we kind of just work with the producer on their specific project to find the best the best programs to fit them into. So if you've got any kind of um, project concepts or ideas, just don't hesitate to call us and we'll work you through what, what we think is the best opportunities there for you.